Hi, I'm Derek Brotherton, CEO of Caddy, and I'm here to introduce you to Caddy 28. Many of you have told us over the last year that the best thing about Caddy 27 is the reliability and performance. We were therefore very keen to ensure that 28 maintains that reliability and performance despite gaining a lot of new functionality. And from feedback so far, we've achieved that. Almost all the new features that you'll see today are the result of requests from our users. From single person practices to large governmental departments. The ideas that come from the user base is what makes Caddy so different and so much more productive than most other systems. So what's new in Caddy 28? When we introduced GIS technology into Caddy a few years back, we knew there was a need for it, but we never anticipated quite how popular it would be. Caddy 28 adds a lot of new features to the GIS, making it easier and more flexible to use, and better integrated with other apps such as the Survey and DTM. We've also introduced the long sought after vehicle turning or sweat path analysis tools, improved licensing, New tools for working with as-built surveys, faster editing in both 2D and 3D, and improved presentation. These are just a few of the areas that have been enhanced over the last year. In fact, there are so many new features this year that to keep Charles' presentation to a reasonable length, we're highlighting just the more important ones. Other more trivial improvements you'll discover as you use 28 by reading the command line or the on-screen prompts. Thank you for taking time out to watch the presentation, and I hope that you enjoy your Caddy 28. This first command is on the civil side, and that's when it comes to your turning circles. So as I zoom in, we're going to make use of these yellow polylines. If I select the line, Caddy confirms polyline 1, because this is the path that the command is going to follow. So let's just hide some of these layers. And the command itself is under application. We go to civil, and we go down to vehicle turning. Now the first option says create vehicle swift path. Now in this dialog, if I select the first vehicle, you will see that as I use my down arrow on my keyboard, Caddy will give you a preview as well as the specifications below that. The first exercise that we're going to do is just the normal car. So it's going to be that as to P, as you can see the specification. And then on the right hand side, you will see I've switched on draw blocks as well as dynamic display. Now, as you move your pointer over it, Caddy will give you an explanation, but I will explain as we go along the command. Then we've got configure graphics. So if I click on configure graphic, that is the pen colors that Caddy is going to use. Now at any stage, you can change to a different pen color as well as to a different line style. So the first one is the vehicle color. Then you've got your front wheel path. You've got your rear wheel path. You've got your hitch path as well as then your trailer wheel paths. So if I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to say OK and Caddy will ask us, indicate the start of the polyline for the front left wheel path. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to indicate the polyline. At the moment, my multi-view block, and that is why I come back to that tick where I say use block. That means it gives me a presentation of my vehicle itself. It's not just a normal square block. As I move my pointer, I can left click where I would like to place a representation of my vehicle because I would like to see what happens at the bends. So as I move my pointer, I can just left click and it plays a presentation. As I go into the drive through that's when it comes to your normal car. Now let's use a track. So let's just zoom out, go application, the same path, civil, vehicle turning, create vehicle spread path. And this time we're going to make use of the Astro WB14. This time there's a trailer involved and the dynamic display. That's as I move, I left click, then it's dynamically. So Caddy will ask us, indicate the start of the polyline for the front left wheel path. So I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to left click. Because I use the block, it's give me a presentation of my vehicle, my horse and trailer. So let's go to the first corner. I can just left click and it plays a representation of my vehicle. Let's go down on the straight. Let's see what's happening here at the corner. And the next bend. And there we go. Now you can see exactly if I go back to those settings, application, civil, vehicle turning, create vehicle sweep path, and we go to the configure pen colors. As you can see, my white is going to be my trailer path. My cyan pen number four, that will be my hitch path. 
my green itself, it will be my red wheel path and my front wheel path is going to be on the yellow side. So that's where it comes when you use your configuration. If you want to delete or redo the option, you can just double left click because now it's a pattern and you can press delete. Alternatively, you can just go to the second command and the application civil vehicle turning and you can ask it to update the existing sweep path. So as soon as I indicate the polyline, as you can see, that's if you want to add additional block onto the path. Press escape, r for region and here's my turning circles. The licensing, on the top right hand side, if you go to help, we go down to license info, Caddy will display your licensing. Now it can be that you've installed your Caddy software, uh, you've already used your evaluation period, 14 days, then Caddy will ask you for a license key. Now it can be linked to a different products. It can be like a professional, budget mechanical, budget survey, budget architectural. So now I'm gonna show you how to force your license to use a specific key. Now, if I go to my update activation, on my right hand side, Caddy will pick up the first license in the list. So as you can see, I've got more than one license on this PC. If I want to see the network licenses, I can include my network keys. So if I now click on a drop down, you will see there will be more keys available. You can be specific what key you would like to use. That's if you've got a setup like there's cloud licenses involved, there's professionals, there's badges involved. Although you can see I'm running in a professional. My professional key at the moment starts with 305. I know of a specific key 256 that's a budget mechanical so that 256 number is in the list so now i'm going to ask caddy when it comes to my license tool use this specific key so if i'm going to say okay caddy will ask to restart i'm going to say yes and as caddy starts bottom left budget mechanical and the number starts with 256 so now i'm making use of my budget mechanical license and as you can see on the top left hand side caddy confirms budget mechanical and now I just want to show if I want to go back to my original license. I go back to my license info and I can ask Caddy use my local key on my PC. So as soon as I say local dongle soft lock key, I'm going to say OK and Caddy will ask to restart again. And my license, I'm back on a professional. Your drawing units now displays on screen. So if you look at your status bar at the bottom, you will see displays your drawing units. Now this is a survey drawing, so it's supposed to be in meters. Now as you can see, it displays an M, so this is correct. If I go to another drawing, this also presents a survey drawing, you will see that my drawing units is in meters. Because previously, if there was no units assigned to your drawing, so I'm gonna open a drawing that I know there's no units assigned. But Caddy will then tell you, your drawing has no units assigned. Go to configure model space workspace to assign units. So if I say OK, that means no units is assigned. So if I look at my status bar, it says none. So I can now change it to millimeters because that's the correct drawing units I want to use. Or I can go to my model space, workspace setup. And whatever I set to my base unit over here is exactly the same. So let's just change it here to meters. If I say OK, you will see that in my status bar it display meters but i know it need to be millimeters so i can change it in my status bar to millimeters so now my drawing units is set so now i can save the file next time i open it the drawing units will display and it will be correct in this exercise you're going to work with pictures as well as ole objects that's object link embedded in this drawing i've already inserted a picture if i select the picture it confirms it's a raster image this is actually an ECW file. So for those that missed out on the previous launches, to insert ECW files, we got your utilities, batch, insert your reference, ECW files, and it can be either ECW or JP2 type of file. So I've inserted my ECW file, and now I want to bring in an OLE object. Now your OLE object it can be like a Word or a PDF or Excel. So I'm going to bring in an Excel. So I'm going to open my Excel sheet. I'm going to select the content that I want to insert into Caddy. I'm going to right click and I'm going to say copy. I'm going to minimize my Excel and in Caddy we go to file, insert, insert OLE object. It's going to be embedded and I place my Excel. So now at the moment, I will look and see as soon as I'm going to zoom into my picture, Caddy will update or refresh automatically because by default with your installation, it's set to auto regen in the environment set. Same as if I go to my OLE object it refresh automatically. Now, if for some reason you would like to control it, in other words, you're working with a lot of ECW files, 
or well, if files you would like to inject manually by pressing R on the keyboard, then the setting is under configure, environment settings. On the left hand side, you go down to OLE, then you'll see there's an option that says OLE refresh. As I mentioned, it's set by default with the installation to auto. You double click on auto and you can change it to manual. And same as with pictures. If I go to pictures, I can expand the ECW JP2 refresh, change the auto to manual. So if I'm going to say OK, now it's set to manual. So if I'm going to zoom into an area now, it will display blurry, but as soon as I press R on the keyboard for regen, then it will refresh your layout. So let's just zoom out. And as you can see, nothing will update. As soon as I press R for regen, then it will refresh. And the same as when it comes to my OLE. Blurry till I'm going to press R for regen. For this exercise, I'm going to make use of two vertical viewports. So I'm just going to right click, go down to viewport, and I'm going to ask it for two vertical viewports. So on the right hand side, I would like to face it from the front because we're going to work with the UCS. Now, as you can see, my UCS is at zero at the moment. It's at world. So on the left hand side, now I can double left click on the UCS icon. I can press O for offset and I'm going to give it an offset of 200 millimeter. As soon as I'm going to say OK, as you can see on the right hand side in the preview, my UCS is above my objects and on my left hand side, you can also see that my UCS is no longer on the ground at zero. Now to confirm or double check is just move your pointer and you'll see in your status bar at the bottom right, okay, it will show you what is your X, your Y and your Z height. Now, as you can see, it's set to 200. So if I'm going to go now to top view, because we want to generate construction lines or lines or make use of text, hatch, dimensions, the rule says if it's set to 2D, it means the projection of the points will be on your UCS. So if it's set to 3D, then it will not be projected onto your UCS. So I'm going to keep it to 2D. That means anything that I'm going to draw now, lines, construction lines, will be on my UCS. So on my left hand side, I'm going to start off with a geometry command and I want to go parallel. So I'm going to click on parallel command. My distance is going to be 50 millimeter. I'm going to say OK and carry all ask us click on the correct side of the line. So all I have to do is I just have to click where I would like to have construction lines. Now remember this construction line is parallel to my polyline that's at the zero height. So if I'm going to orbit it, my construction lines is on my UCS and my polyline is at the Z height of zero. So let's go back to the top view. And because I'm still in 2D, it means I can go to draw. I can then use polyline lines, it doesn't matter. S for snap, and I can create a new profile on that UCS that if I'm gonna orbit it, all the content I've just drawn now is on the UCS because my snap at the bottom right hand side is set to 2D and not 3D. If I want to put my UCS back to the world, I'm going to press W for world. So now my UCS is back to zero, but the content remains at the Z height of 200 millimeter. The spline command is the existing command, but the enhancement is that you can make use of a polyline profile to create the spline. So in this exercise, yeah, I've got three normal polylines. Now they were just created by if you go to draw and you make use of the P line command. And then you'll see I've got a 3D polyline as well. But I'm first going to show you how you can apply a spline to existing normal 2D polylines. So the command is under draw, circle arc, and we go down to spline. Can you all ask us? Select spline type. Now, as you can see, my first profile, I'm going to ask to be open forced. So click on open forced, and can you all ask us now? Indicate the spline control point from P for polyline, 3D polyline, or U for undo last point. So I'm going to press P for polyline, Gary ask us to indicate the polyline. So I indicate the polyline and it creates a spline according to my polyline profile. If I want to repeat the command, I can just press spacebar on the keyboard. And as you can see, my shape on the right hand side that presents, say, for instance, you've traced a dam. And now I'm going to say it's going to be a closed force. Once again, Gary ask us to indicate the spline control points because I know it's a polyline. I'm going to press P for polyline and I'm going to indicate the polyline. Press spacebar to repeat the command. And I'm going to keep my orthogonal shape as well for a closed force, P for polyline, and I indicate the polyline. And now on the right hand side, you will see it says 3D polyline. Now this 3D polyline is normally applicable if you want to create a spline, say for instance, for cabling between posts. 
So the command that I've used to create this 3D polyline was under draw, 3D primitives, and there's a 3D polyline command. So the spline command is also applicable to my 3D polyline. So we go to draw, circle arc, and we go down to spline. And with this one, it's going to be an open forced. I'm going to click open forced, P for polyline, and I'm going to indicate my 3D polyline. So as soon as I'm going to orbit it, now you will see that now I've created splines by using a normal 2D polylines as a reference or even a 3D polyline. Some of you may be familiar with the survey command. So on the left hand side, if I go down to my survey, you have a command that we can insert your points by specifying the Z type. But say for some reason you're running on either a budget version, architectural or mechanical, and you would like to add points at the Z type, now it's available under the normal point command. So the enhancement to it is, is that you can add a Z height to your points. So in this exercise, you can see I've split up my model space to two viewports. On the left hand side is a top view, and on the right hand side, isometric view. You can change it at any stage, say for instance to a front view. And now as I'm going to add points on the left hand side, CADI will give us a preview on the right hand side. So under geometry, sub column, we're going to make use of that normal point command. And as soon as we read the command line, CADI will ask us, indicate the position for the point, specify the height manually. So if I'm going to press H on the keyboard, CAD will ask us height for point. I'm going to say 500. I'm going to say OK. And CAD will ask me indicate the position for the point. So I'm going to indicate the first point. And as you can see in the preview, it added at the height of say 500 because I know the existing points was added at 2000. So if I want to repeat the command, I can press spacebar. I can just click on the command again. And CAD will ask us indicate the position for the point. I would like to specify the height, so I'm going to press H, and I'm going to make it 1000. As soon as I say OK, Caddy ask us indicate the position for the point, and I'm just going to place it behind it, press Escape. So on the left hand side, if I'm going to orbit it, as you can see, there's my two new points added with different heights, and I can even go another step further. If I make use of my DTM, I can ask Caddy to triangulate those points for me now. And there's my model on the left hand side, a front view on the right hand side. On the selection side, you'll see that once an object is selected, yeah, I select the windows as can confirm the object properties, but you can select any object. It remains selected till you're going to press escape. So if I'm going to orbit my model, as you can see, it remains selected. Um, that's normally for making changes in your object properties of that particular object. So even if I go to TIFA top view, you will see that it remains selected. Even if I go to, let's just change to another view, it remains selected. But if I go to, say, hidden line, it remains selected, wireframe, so I'm going to press escape. As soon as I'm going to press escape, then it will unselect the object. Then you may notice that if I left click my left button of my mouse, now that's the orbit command, or even if you make use of the normal 3D orbit, constraint orbit command, is that you'll notice that there's a green dot. Now that green dot presents the middle or the center point of your 3D orbit. Now that is getting controlled and the setting in your status bar where it says 3D orbit, you will notice that it says use objects on screen as rotation center. Now that's your default setting, but you can tell Gary, set a custom center point for the 3D orbit by clicking on the command and Gary ask us enter the custom center point for 3D orbit. So I'm going to say S for snap. Now you can make use of any particular point if what you would like to use. I'm just going to use this plane now as a reference. So I'm going to indicate the endpoint of the plane. I've set it, so now I'm going to ask it to use this custom point as rotation center. So I click on the command, so that means now if I use my shift left button of my mouse, it use that new reference point as the center of my orbit. Green dot that you see there, the color is also getting controlled in the environment settings. So if I go to environment set on the left hand side and we go down to orbit. If I scroll down, your orbit center, your orbit center size, as well as then the color itself. So if you would like to change the color, it's getting done under your environment set. The announcement when it comes to snap to plane is that previously up to carry 28 if you select your UCS and you move your UCS around a plane you're not always sure which plane it uses so the announcement is when it comes to your snap we go down to snap to plane settings 
Now, first of all, you will see this option that says highlight the plane to snap to. So it's highlighted in a specific color, and then it will also make that plane transparent. So I'm going to say OK. So the only thing that I'm going to change now is at the bottom right hand side, I'm going to ask it for 3D UCS follow. And I'm going to change, uh, instead of showing the grid, it's only the icon itself. The command I'm going to make use of is say lines. And as I move my point, it picks up the plane, it highlights it, and it makes it transparent. So if I left click, then it activates the command and it draw the line. Let's make use of a rectangle command. As I move my pointer, as you can see, it highlights the plane. So then I can just left click and I can draw my rectangle. Let's use a circular command picks up the plane and I can start my circle command and that's not only uh, applicable to the 2D command uh, same as say for instance your catalog I want to bring in some content from my catalog I'm going to drag like in this case the solar panel and as I move it highlights the plane and I can just left click and then place it onto that plane the catalog is not a new application but if you missed out on last year launch I'm just going to refresh that a shortcut has been added to your status bar at the bottom. As I move my pointer, as you can see, if I left click, then I can show or hide the catalog. Alternatively, you can activate it from the toolbar and the view, scroll down, and you find the catalog as well. Now, the announcement that's been added to the catalog is when it comes to your wall styles. Previously, if you activate the wall command, Caddy will ask you, indicate start of wall. But if you read the command line, Caddy will now ask us, or choose E for entity to get geometry from. So in this exercise, just go back to object properties, all the lines that you see in yellow, they are normal lines. And then the lines that you see in green, they are polylines. So we're going to apply to lines and polylines. So let's just go back to the catalog, and I'm going to start off with an external wall. So I activate the command, and now I just have to press E for entity and indicate the first line. As you can see in the command line, indicate start of wall or choose E for entity. So I'm going to press E for entity, next wall, E for entity, next wall. I'm going to press escape and now I like to do my internal walls. Let's go to brick 110. Once again, carry ask us, indicate start of wall or choose entity. So I'm going to press E for entity, indicate the first one, indicate the second one. By using line or a polyline as a reference to apply a wall style to it. Now you'll notice also that if I select those two walls, previously up to carry 27, you could only, if you select the wall, change the justification because you may notice that when you apply the wall, it's either on the inside or the outside of your polyline or your line. It depends on the direction of the line. So what I'm going to show you now is that you can select multiple, more than one wall, and in the object properties, when it comes to your justification, you can now set it to say, for instance, left, as you can see now it's on the inside of the polyline or the lines, or I can set it to right, or I can set it to center. So that's also another enhancement added to the settings of your walls. Now, when it comes to disk walls, for the users that's familiar with point cloud or laser or hand sketch, will agree that not everything is always square. So I'm first going to introduce the command and then we're going to apply it onto this hand sketch. I'm going to start off with a wall. My variable width is 220. I'm going to say OK. I'm just in freehand and I'm going to create three walls. That's a bit skew as you can see. And now I'm going to add a dimension group. And now you can see that although my wall width is supposed to be 220, and display 216 for the simple reason that if I go to my dimension and I ask it to highlight the dimension object between point A and point B, horizontal is actually 216 because my walls are skewed. So the command that's added to carry 28 is under draw. We go down to walls and in the sub column we go down to the skew walls. My selection is going to be rectangle, my angles by default, but you can add additional angles if you like to and my tolerance is 5 degrees. So I'm going to say OK, and carry ask us indicate the first corner of rectangle. So I'm going to draw a rectangle, selection box, and as you can see, now it fix the walls, and my dimensions is also 220, that is correct. So let's apply it to hand sketch. So I'm going to my wall command, 220, I'm going to say OK, and as you can see, I'm just in freehand, so here's going to be a lot of walls that's going to be skew, E for end, spacebar, make it 110 for internal, from here up to there, 
key for int, spacebar, e for int, and we're just going to create those e for int. So if I now I'm going to switch off my image, now as you can see, nothing is square. So the command is under draw, we go to walls, we go down to the key walls, I'm going to say OK, I'm going to indicate those walls, now it fix it. If for some reason there's an opening, all you can make use of is the normal trim command. As you can see, trim objects to an object. I can say, this is my master, and I would like to trim this one. And then I can make sure that the rest is also nice clean up between the walls. When it comes to your windows and your door schedule table, existing command, but I'm going to show you that once you're going to zoom to a specific object, it will keep it selected. So on my left hand side, as you can see, is the window schedule table. Now the command that I've used is under draw, go down to scheduling, and then you get your window schedule and your door schedule. Remember, this is on your AEC model. Then on the right hand side is just my model itself. So I'm going to change it to hidden line. And now we're going to zoom to a specific window. So on the left hand side, I've noticed that window number four, the material, it says timber, although the type says NC12F. I'm going to select the table, I right click, I'm going to go to the schedule table option, and I'm going to ask it to zoom to a specific object in the schedule table. Okay, it will then ask us, select the schedule table item. So I'm going to select number four. Now, first of all, as you can see on the left hand side, it's giving me a top view where the window is. And on the right hand side, there you can see there's the preview of the window. And in my object properties, if I scroll down, I can see that style is a NC12F. So this is supposed to be a steel window. So now I can correct the table by just right click. I'm going to go to edit door window assembly style. And in this dialog at the bottom, you get your property set. And I'm going to change the timber to steel. I'm going to say OK. I'm going to say apply. Close the dialog. And now if I go to zoom last, now it updates my table. In this exercise, we're going to talk about subdivisions. I've got my top plan, and then I've got an elevation. with the yellow in the front, the green in the middle, and the gray at the back. So each color presents a different depth of my model, as you can see on my elevation on the right hand side. I'm going to show now how to create one. So I've just made a copy of that same model. So on the left hand side, under bolt, we go down to vertical section. I'm going to make use of the quick section. Okay, it will ask us to indicate the section profile. So indicate the start point. I'm going to hold down my tab key because I want to go perpendicular to my model. Second point, and then I'm going to press escape. Okay, it will ask us to indicate the section extent. I include my whole model. And then Carol will ask us to indicate position for section. So I'm just going to place it on the left hand side and it creates the elevation or the section. This is where the enhancement comes in Carry 28 is that if I select that section line and I right click CSM, now you will see that it's added manage subdivision so i'm going to click on manage subdivision and at the moment as you can see there's none so i'm going to say new i'm going to start at 500 i'm going to say new again the second one will be at say 2500 and the third one will be at 5500 but i'll show you now you can manually change your subdivisions so i've just add those three i'm going to say okay it's give me a preview so once i select my subdivisions now I can change it manually. The third one need to see up to that level, the second one up to there, and the first one remains over here. So now we're going to update your section or your elevation. So first of all, you're going to select it, and in your object properties, you will see under specific, your style is by default set to standard. So I'm going to change it now to ask it to use the elevation with subdivisions. And as soon as I'm going to press escape, I'm going to refresh the section, Refresh section, press escape, and as you can see, there's my three colors. Exactly the same as what you've seen over here. My yellow in the front, then the green, and then the gray at the back. When it comes to safe views, a safe views is not only applicable to 3D models, although we do use it a lot on the 3D side. But I'm going to show you now that if you've got safe views, even if it's a 2D plan, you can take your safe views to a new drawing as well because for some reason you have to copy your model to a new drawing and on the support side then we normally assist you in the view we go to component manager so you can take your sheets across so now i'm going to show you how to take your saved views across from one drawing to another so the command that we're going to use is under view and in a sub column saved views now as you can see there's no saved views yet 
So let's create a few. So the first one is going to be, let's say, North Elevation. So I'm going to click on the gear because I can take this existing angle now and it's going to save it as a view. So I'm going to say NE for North Elevation and I'm going to say Save. I'm going to say Close and then I would like to create a view from, say, the section. So I'm going to click on the gear and we call this one Section. And I'm going to say Save. And I say Close. And then I would also like to get one from a site plan. Now, as you may notice, the site plan is rotated 90 degrees, but I can also rotate my the site view. So in other words, I'm going to rotate my UCS and then I'm going to save it. So I double click on the UCS icon, in for more, and I'm going to ask Eddie, rotate UCS in current plane. My rotation angle is going to be 90 degrees and I'm going to say from object because I'm going to use this line as a reference. So I'm going to say from object, indicate the line, so now CAD or the UCS is set to face my drawing from this angle. Now I'm facing it from the right hand side, but I would like to save this view. So I'm going to click on the gear and I'm going to call this one 90 site plan. So I'm going to say save and I'm going to say close. So as you can see, I've created now three saved views. I'm going to save the drawing. So I'm going to say file save. I'm going to zoom out, W for world, T for top. And now I'm going to select everything because now I want to copy it to a new drawing. So I either use Control A, I can select it, right click, we go down to clipboard, copy to clipboard. Okay, it will ask me to indicate the handle point, but I'm going to use D for drawing origin. That means 0, 0, 0. So I press D for drawing origin. We're going to a new drawing, right click, paste from clipboard. Once again, D for drawing origin. So my reference point is 0, 0, 0. Press escape, F4 for zoom extends. And as you can see on my new drawing, my safe views is 0 at the moment. So now I'm going to show you how to import it by just clicking on the gear. And on the right hand side, you will see the announcement that says import. So I'm going to click on import and Caddy will ask us drawing to import from. I'm going to browse to the file that we've just saved. I'm going to say open. Caddy picks up those safe views. So I'm going to import all three of them. I'm going to say import. I'm going to say close. So now they will be in the list. So let's go to the section. And as you can see, it takes me to that saved view. Let's go to the north elevation. And let's go to the rotated 90 degrees side plan. When it comes to structural members, now most of you are familiar under bold. We go down, we've got the option that says structural member. Now under specific, we've got different profile types but we do find that clients like to create their own structural member profile for instance like when it comes to dodo rails or skirtings or cornish so i'm just going to recap quickly on how to create a structural member and then how to apply it to a polyline and then you can mirror it as well first of all as you can see if i select the object you can see it's a polyline so it's a close polyline profile you're going to right click once it's selected you're going to go to convert to and you see this option that says convert to structural member style okay will ask for a name so i'm just going to call it sm1 i'm going to say okay and okay will ask us origin of no shape so i'm going to just click in the middle and can okay ask us style created would you like to create a structural member using the style so i'm going to say yes because I'm going to make use of a beam and my profile source is going to be a polyline. I'm going to say OK and Kari will ask us, indicate the line or polyline, indicate the polyline and if I zoom out, press escape, there it took the profile, change it to a structural member and apply it to the polyline. If I go top view and I select this structural member and I right click, then I can ask Kari to mirror the structural member. So if I click on mirror, Okay, it'll ask me specified angle. I'm going to keep it on 90 degrees. I'm going to say OK. And if I read the command line, okay, it'll ask us indicate point about which to mirror, C to copy. So if I want to have a copy, I'm going to press C on the keyboard. And I'm going to indicate the point about which to mirror. And there's a copy of my structural member. The next command is UCS related. Now, it's an existing command, but it's been added to your CSM. So if you right click, you go down to your UCS you see that you've got the option that says set your UCS from two points or from three points and now you'll see this one that says set UCS from current view now why would you like to use it so if I'm going to orbit my model it's not a saved view I'm going to zoom in I'm going to make it perspective as well and now I would like to add something from this angle so my UCS is at the moment at world I'm going to right click we go down to UCS and I'm going to ask how to set UCS from current view 
Now my view is, my view says, is perpendicular to my view. Now if my setting is set to 2D, remember it says points projected onto my UCS. So anything that I'm going to draw now will be on my UCS, like lines or text or leaders. So let's do an exercise. Let's add a leader. I'm going to say from here up to there, key for end, and I'm going to add text because I know I gave it a name, structural member one, and I can place the text over here. I can draw lines, as I say, because I remember I'm on 2D. So just freehand, I'm going to add, say, a block over there and a block over here. So it can be that you like to just quickly do a screen capture and take it to Word. But as you can see, my UCS is perpendicular to my model. And if I'm going to over it now, there's it on my UCS, the content. The next command is the existing command, but it's been added to your CSM. And that is if you go to your layering and display, you'll see this option that says show last layer display. That if you work with layers, and for this exercise, I've created groups. So I'm just going to toggle through them. There's a layer group, there's a layer group, and there's select all. So if I'm selecting an existing layer group, and I say OK, then it displays only those selected layers. And now for some reason, you carry on working, and then you decide, OK, I want to go all layers, and now I want to return to that previous layer group. So all I have to do is I can just right click, Layering and display, and I can ask it to show last layer display, and it shows the selected layers. When it comes to moving objects to the front plane or to the back plane, so I'm going to first show you the command. So the announcement is that the command will be in a loop or it will repeat itself till you're going to press escape. As you can see, I've got a green hatch in front of the other hatches. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to select the first one, I'm going to right click, I'm going to go to layering and display, I'm going to say move to back plane. Now it already moved the first one because it was selected. So now carry ask us, indicate object to move to bottom. So I can just select the next one, I can indicate the next object, the next object. So now we're going to apply it to a model. And as you can see, this is elevation. The tree is in front of my model and it needs to be at the back. So I'm going to select the first object, right click, layering and display, move to back plane. It already moved to the back plane. Then I can move my second building behind this tree in the front but I would like to move the other two trees behind those. So it's still in a loop, it's repetitive, till you're going to press escape. When it comes to creating viewports from a 3D model, although this presents a mechanical part, it can be a house model as well. If you create a viewport, if I go to the normal process, the rectangular viewport from this model, and I go to my sheet, and I'm happy with my scale, and I place my viewport. You may notice that, first of all, the render mode remains the same. It's no longer wireframe. Secondly, your materials and your textures, that settings are all crept from the model space into your viewport. So if I press spacebar, just to create another viewport, I can place the viewport. You can make changes to individual viewports as well. So I can select the second viewport and I can tell Caddy that my render mode, I would like that to be thumb shaded wireframe and my materials textures Say for instance, I would like my materials on, but my textures off. So if I press R for regen, as you can see, it updates that viewport. You can also make a copy of the existing viewport. Let's place one there and there. Regen. And let's say the bottom left hand viewport, I would like that to be a 3D wireframe. And on the right hand side, I would like that one to be hidden line. So individually, you can update your viewport by selecting the viewport and you can toggle between the settings. But you can also select multiple viewports where it says the content, I can ask it. My render mode at the moment, I would like it to be in two different render modes. But my materials textures, I would like them to be all switched on. So I'm going to ask it. materials textures on. R for regen, and as you can see it updates the viewport. So let's save it to a PDF, to go file, save other export, save as PDF, it's going to be landscape, it's going to be my current sheet, I like to save my layer info with it. That's the advantage of saving to a PDF. And I'm going to say save, and Caddy will open the PDF once it's saved. On the right hand side, thong shaded wireframe. I've got my 3D wireframe as well as my hidden line. Another enhancement when it comes to between your model and your sheets, I'm first going to show you what you add up to Caddy 28, and then I'm going to show you that what we call a dynamic list. Previously, if you right click either on a sheet tab or on a model tab, and you say go to sheet, Caddy opens this dialog. Now, new to Caddy 28 is if I go to configure and I go down to my environment settings, you'll see that there's an option that says sheets, 
and then we go to maximum number of sheets for dynamic list now i've reduced mine to 10 just to show you what you had so i'm going to jack it up to 20. now that is your default value so if you're going to install your carry 28 yours will be set to 20 sheets for the dynamic list after 20 then it will display the dialog again so i'm going to say okay so if i'm going to right click on the model tab and i say go to sheet now displays what we call a dynamic list and then you select your sheet that you want to go to and it takes you to your sheet so if it's set to 20 if you've got 21 uh, sheets then it will make use of the dialog less than 20 and it will show you the dynamic list For the mechanical users, you'll notice that if you go to mechanical command, you go to apps, mechanical, make draw, and you go to center line, you'll notice that at the bottom, there's also an option added that says create as block. And now I'm going to show you the enhancement or the advantage of using it as block. So if I'm going to say, okay, okay, you'll ask me, indicate center of line. So I'm going to use the correct snap mode to that point. If for freehand on the outside, as you can see now, create my center line. So now I can just carry on, indicate the next point, the next point, and the next point. But now I would like to make a use of a smaller one. So if I press spacebar, repeat previous command, I'm going to say OK. Once again, indicate the start point, indicate the end point of my center line. Now as you can see, that is smaller than the previous one. I'm just going to carry on, indicate the next point, next point, and next point press escape so now i've got two sets of center lines the properties are exactly the same but the size differ so now i would like to change the pen color or the line style or the pen width i'm going to go to doesn't matter which block because as soon as i select that center line you'll notice that my object property says it's a block reference so we're going to edit this one block reference so i'm going to right click block edit block and as you can see it gray out my drawing that means you're in edit mode so now i can select the content and i can change the color i can change the line style if i like to and i can change the line width so for this exercise i'm changing it to let's say 0.35 so if i'm going to press escape right click and i say end edit block you may notice the following if i'm going to switch on to show my line width on the screen it's a thicker pen if i zoom out you will notice that it actually updates wherever that block reference is in use regardless what is the size but it did update the properties for instance line style pen color even to a different a layer so any properties that you change inside the block will update the block without changing the size of the block itself let's come to scheduling blocks you will see that in this exercise, if I select the content, you will see that I've got 26 block references. So I would like to add them to a scheduled table. So it's an existing command I'm going to show you, but then I'll show you the new enhancement. So the command that we're going to make use of is under modifying, blocks arrays, and we go down to schedule blocks. Now in this dialog, I'm going to set it to scope my selection. I'm going to ask Carrie to schedule all my blocks for this exercise. And here comes a new announcement. Up to Caddy 27, it made use of only a standard style. So now I'm going to ask Caddy for auto create a style. And have a look and see what is my row height. It's 300. So as soon as I'm going to say OK, Caddy will ask me, indicate the top left point of the table. So I'm going to left click, it creates the table. My pen color itself, it's by block. So that's why it looks at my active pen color. So now I would like to make changes to it. I would like to either make use of a different font or a pen color so now we're going to make changes to the style itself so to do that we're going to go to annotate and we go to create table now i said to you remember that 300 now as you can see it's give us a new table style in the list and it's called block schedule height 300 so that's the style of this existing table now so we're going to manage this table so i'm going to click on manage table style it's selected at the moment so i'm going to go to modify so in this dialog I'm just going to show you that when it comes to your data, I'm not going to make use of background fill. I just want to show you that it will update the preview on the left hand side. I'm not going to use a background fill. I'm happy with my alignment, middle center. I'm happy with my format. It's going to be text. But what I would like to change is the text color. So I'm going to change my text tab, my font style. I can change it if you like to. But my text height is 240. But instead of making use of my active pen color, that's cyan at the moment, 
I'm going to ask Caddy that my text color need to be specific pen number two yellow color. Then we can go to the header. When it comes to my header, as you can see on my left hand side, it did update the preview. Now the header is here at the top, so my text style remains the same, but I would like to make my text a bit bigger. So let's make that 300. That will be my text height. And the pen color for my header, let's make that pen number three. So if I go to my general, once again, if I add the background, Let's give you a preview on the left hand side. So this is how you can modify or make changes to your table style that you used for your scheduling. So if I'm going to say close and I'm going to say OK, R4 region, there's my yellow pen color and there's my header as well. That's in green. In this exercise, I'm going to show you how to create a part like you on the left hand side by just making use of mass elements. So first of all, if I zoom in, if I select the content, you will see that they are all mass elements. I've got a base plate and then I've got a vertical column. I'm going to start off by creating the holes inside the base plate. So the first thing you have to do is you're going to select the mass element. You're going to right click and you're going to go to make and then we're going to say make mass group. If I click on the command, color has changed because it looks at my active color. If I select the mass group now and I right click, CSM, you'll see this option and the mass group that says attach. Now you can either add or you can subtract. Now we would like to subtract. So I'm going to click on the second option and Cat will ask us, indicate the AC objects. So I'm going to zoom in, indicate the first object, second one, first one, second one, E for end. And now if I'm going to go select my mass element and I go right click and I say lighting and display, display only selected object, then you'll see it cut the holes. Let's show all layers. So now we're going to do exactly the same with the vertical pillar. So I'm going to select the object. Now that's the mass element. I right click and we first want to convert it to a mass group. So go make, make mass group. Now I'm going to select the mass group again. I right click and now I'm going to tell the mass group that we would like to attach. In this case, subtract again and can ask us to indicate the object. So I'm just going to zoom in and I'm going to indicate these mass elements that we would like to subtract. E for end, so if I now select these two mass groups, right click, lighting and display, display only selected objects, then you will see there's my mechanical part. Where the mass groups also come in handy is when it comes to building. Now you will see that my building, my schedule table is volume. So both of these two buildings are exactly the same, except building number one has got an extra mass element and that presents a dormer. So let's say when it comes to do the calculations for air conditioning, um, if I extend this dormer or make it bigger, as you can see, it updates in my schedule table. So although if I select the objects, they say it's mass elements and object properties, it's actually based on converting to a mass group. So if I'm gonna show my mass groups, and then it's exactly the same as what we just did with the mechanical part. So by using the mass elements converted to your mass group, any adjustments that you're going to make, it will have an influence on your calculations as well. So if I select the roof, as you can see, if I make a change to the roof, it will update my volume. If I select the building itself and I make a change to it, it will update the volume as well. Another exercise when it comes to volume as well, so I've got a building over here. And if I change the height of the building, you can see it updates the volume of the building. Users that work with uh, different CAD systems will love this one. And that's when it comes to your text. Now in this exercise, it's a survey drawing. And if I zoom in and I select the text, you'll see that it says text, not in text. So you need to give this drawing back as text. So previously we say to you, let's convert it to M text because you would like to make changes to its properties. So have a look and see how quick and easy it is now in Caddy 28. Because if you say now control A and I'm going to go to and select my text, I don't have to convert it to multi-line text before I can make changes to it. So you will see in a specific annotative, my height. So for this exercise, let's make a 2.5. Uh, you've got your width factor, your justify and your style itself. So at any stage now, even if the drawing comes in with normal text, you can work with the text and you can save it, you can send it back, no longer to convert it to multi-line text. When it comes to properties of hatches, if I select the hatch, in my object properties, it displays the area. Now, because my drawing is in millimeters, it will display my area in millimeters. 
So what we normally advise is under measure, you can go to alternative units and you can ask Caddy, because my drawing unit is millimeters, I would like my measurement units to be in meters and show alternative units. If I say OK, now that setting is applicable to your normal measure command. So if I'm going to say measure area, for instance, and I say inside, and I indicate inside, Caddy will display my measure area in millimeters because that's my drawing units and in brackets it will tell me square meters now the same is now applicable to the hatches so if i now go to my normal quick hatch i'm going to just add a full a normal full color i'm going to add it to that third room and now i would like to calculate those three areas so all i do is i go to my object properties if i select the first hatch it will give me my area of the first one and as soon as i select the second one and the third one it actually calculate all three of the hatches it's give me my calculate area in millimeters but if i left click on that value you'll see that at the bottom okay, it will tell me my cumulative area of so many square millimeters and in brackets it's give me 34.0 square meters the online learning is not only for the users or the clients that's doing the online training you will see now I'm going to run through all four of them. You will see that the first one will take us to the online training site. And then these exercises. And then I'm going to show you the quick start link. Now the quick start is to help you with the installation, your activation, uh, getting started videos like how the mouse button setup works, how layering works. Then the YouTube channel. Now that is mostly videos that's available as well as some webinars. So the first one I'm going to show you is the online training website. So if I click on the first link, okay, it will open the browser and take you to the online learning site. Available courses, getting started with CADI, that's your normal 2D basic course. Then the getting started with an AEC course, that's your architectural engineering construction, that's your 3D course. Then we've got the CADI survey, the view, that is your rendering side of CADI, and the digital terrain modeling. The second link will open online training exercise files. So depends on what course you're busy with, CAD will ask you to download some of those exercises and then you compare it to the answer of the course. So if I open the view course, there's a lot of exercises that you have to do. If I right click, I can say download all view course files. So that means it will download it to your local drive and then you can just open it. If say for instance, you haven't got internet access, you can download all the files and then you can open it from that location. Otherwise, if you're on the internet and you are busy with module number two, you can click on the file that you have to open. You're going to say open file. Caddy okay, opens the file and then you just have to make some changes to it. You're going to do a render and then you compare it to the answer. So that is when it comes to your second link. Then the third one is to visit the Caddy Quick Start web page. Now this is handy for first time user because now we're showing you how to download of the software. Depends on what browser you're using. Then there's a video how to install the software then the activation itself, and then getting started. So this is not only for new users, even if you're an existing user, you can run through those videos because there will be something that you just missed out. So for instance, auto snap, polar snap settings, mouse button setup, plot styles, sheets, viewports. So just to refresh your memory. And then if I go down, there's some webinars there as well. And now let's go to the last link. And that is your YouTube channel. So if I click on the link, it will take us to YouTube and as I scroll down as you can see a lot of videos is available you can search for a specific video so between those four links it's definitely going to help you for understanding carry better on the rendering side you'll notice that under the environment set if I go on my left hand side down to view my root menu we go to environment set you see that there's three announcements the first one, under natural lights, you will see that there's a sky intensity added. And then on the left hand side, under your schemes, you will see that there's a night clear sky being added. And then when it comes to your search, you will see that you can now search by province. Because some of you may notice that if you search for Pretoria, you'll find more than one Pretoria. If you search for Boldfontein, there's one in Bloemfontein, there's one in Pretoria as well. So now you can search by province as well. So the first exercise, natural light is switched on. It's a normal day clear sky in Eastern Cape at the moment. So I'm going to say OK, we're just going to do a normal day a render. I'm going to hit the render command. I'm going to keep it basic. I'm going to use progressive rendering. I'm going to say render. And then we're going to compare it with the night clear sky. 
This is the day clear sky, as you can see on the shadows, with an image in the background. So now we're just going to make a few adjustments on the environment set. First of all, we're going to change to night clear sky. I'm going to say OK. And then because I'm using a, a bright image in the background, I'm going to reduce the brightness. Under the background option, you'll see that there's a scaled image option. So I browse to the image for background and the brightness by default is 1. So I'm just going to reduce it to say 0 0.2. I'm going to say OK and we're going to hit render. Keep exactly the same settings. And as you can see the difference between the two, the night render, my image in the background, is not as bright as during daylight. And as well as when it comes to your artificial lights, you can see the down light is better. When it comes to retrieve settings from previous renders, most of you will agree that you're not normally doing one render. Because each and every render you make changes to your natural light or ambient light or materials that you make changes to and then later on you would like to fall back on a previous render that you're happy with some of the settings. So now I'm going to show you how to retrieve previous settings. So in this exercise I'm going to hit render so you just can see how this render looks like. So when you switch on the lock settings it means Caddy will then save that settings that you set up. Now that is your render settings itself as well as your environment settings that's putting together in a lock file. So I'm not going to lock this one I'm just going to hit render so you can see how this render looks like. See this is a very dull render. There's no natural light comes in from the side or the shadows itself. So now I would like to retrieve another render settings. So if I say close render, the command that we're going to use is existing command. Recall render settings. Now I've locked those three renders. Now it doesn't mean you have to use exactly the same drawing. To recall those settings. You can make use of another drawing that you use and you like the settings. Say for instance in this case I like my advanced finishes. So then I can retrieve on drawing number two the advanced finishes from drawing number one. But in this case as you can see I'm using the same drawing and with this render I've made more advanced settings. The natural light comes through, the shadows, so I would like to retrieve these settings to this current drawing. On the right hand side I can tell Caddy what would I like to retrieve. So the lighting I would like to retrieve, my location, my render quality, my advanced finishes, my tone mapping as well as my scheme. So as soon as I'm going to hit retrieve settings, I'm going to say OK, it overrides my existing settings. So now if I'm going to hit render, it makes use of that new settings. So I'm going to say render. And now this render looks exactly the same as the one that I retrieved the settings from. In this exercise, I'm going to work with lights. I split up my model space into two viewports. On the left hand side, you can see the elevation. And on the right hand side, we're going to toggle between the levels. So to activate the light command under the view, we go to lights. I said open the dialog. Now the first enhancement is when it comes to your factories or your warehouses, the commercial bulb type is being added to the list. So for our first exercise, I'm going to start off with a sodium 35 watt. Now, as you can see, my UCS is on my WCS is at zero. So as I move my pointer, okay, it will confirm in my status bar that my UCS Z height is zero. I'm going to select my bulb type. My type is going to be a point light, and I'm going to click on the plus sign. Now, here comes the next announcement. Because Caddy will ask us, indicate new position for the light. The height is currently set to 2400. If I want to change it, I can press H for height or I can set the name. So first let's set the name. So I'm going to say N for name. And I would like to add in front GF for ground floor. So if I'm going to say OK, updates in a dialog. So I know that the name of this bulb is going to be ground floor sodium. Now before I'm going to place it, my height is currently 2400. So if I want to change it, I can just press H for height. And I'm going to make it 2300. I'm going to say OK and I can place my bulb. Now I want to go to my second story. So I select from my levels my second floor. As you can see, it takes my UCS to the second floor. Now that's where the next announcement comes in. Because now, if I'm going to add a light, Caddy will look at your UCS, and from your UCS, it will place the light. So it's no longer from your WCS, it will be from your UCS. So my bulb type, let's make use of an LED cool white 5.5 watt. My type is going to be a spotlight, and I'm going to click on the plus sign. Now, once again, Caddy will tell me, indicate new position. Currently, my height is 2400. If I want to change it, I can just press H for height. 
and let's make it 2300. If I say OK, I would like to change the name. I can press name. But what I want to show you is that even if you get a drawing from somebody else that used lights but it didn't go with names, then I'm going to show you in the object properties how to change the name. So I'm not change the name at the moment. I'm just going to place it and then in object properties we're going to rename it. So okay, I'll just indicate the position. So this is the spotlight. I would like it to be from this side, so all the way up to the center of that portrait. And as you can see, my preview on the left hand side. So let's show all my layers. Press W for world, my UCS on world, and we do a render. My second story displays my spotlight and my ground floor is my sodium light. And now I like to rename my spotlight because it's on my second story. So I can close my render. And if I go to my object properties, now in my object properties, I can select the light from my model itself, or otherwise you can just go to your lights selected from the dialog and then go to properties and we can make changes to it. So as it says that the name is LED, I like to add second floor. As soon as I go back to my lights dialog, you will see that it will update. When it comes to saved views, now you're familiar with the command. In the view, in the sub column, we go to saved views. Now in this view, drop down, I've already saved three views. Now the enhancement in Carry 28 is that if I go to view at the top and I go down to control perspective camera, in this dialog, on the right hand side, it says show camera symbol. So if I switch it on, now I can see exactly those three cameras. So if I say close for this moment, when I select the camera, then you will see the angle that this camera, the cone area. So let's select the outside one and let's zoom in and we can select the inside one. And then you can even go another step further. You can right click while the camera is selected. I would like to see that view. So I can right click and I'm going to ask Caddy set camera view. So I'm going to click on the command and Caddy will take me to that specific view. Let me just change my material textures on. And as you can see, that is the view. Now we would like to do the fine tuning. So I'm going to go to view. I go back to my control perspective camera. And now what I'm going to show you I want to move to back. So I'm going to click on back. See, we move back. And then I can ask it, let's move a bit to the right hand side. I can rotate clockwise. And then if I'm happy with the new view, then I can just save it, save as. And you just give it a new view. So let's call this one new insight. So say OK. So that's when it comes to your fine tuning. Then on the right hand side, my vertical angle. So at the moment, I'm looking eight degrees down. So if I'm going to set it to zero, I press enter, then it's at eye height at 1.8. So you can control your angle to look down or to look up. Then your step size, that's 500 millimeter. Okay, that looks at your current units. Now mine is set to millimeters. So when it comes to fine tuning, it's advisable to make use of the command and the view control perspective camera. When it comes to the walkthrough, you will see the enhancements that's been added to the command. Now, as you can see, it's my model. We're going to follow this yellow spline, and then we're going to make changes to it. So the command itself is under view. We go down to walkthrough, and you see there's an option that says do walkthrough. Now, remember, this is not a training session. I'm just giving you the demonstration. So you have to set up your walkthrough. That is your amount of cameras you would like to use, etc. So I'm just showing you the enhancement. The command itself is under view, walkthrough, and we go do the walkthrough. Now, first of all, the dialog I've changed for those that are familiar with the walkthrough. Now, my render modes, as you can see at the moment, it displays wireframe. So I'm just going to change to thong shader. This uh, camera location. Now, as I move along, as we follow the path, you can see what's going to happen. And over here, you can see we've got a, a shut door. So I'm going to show you how to open that door. And then we're facing that window, and then I'm going to show you how to look to the left hand side so you can see the furniture. So we've got a sliding bar, you've got a start and an end frame. We're going to use it when we make changes to the door itself. Then we've got on the left hand side the lens length. Now that's your perspective. Now at the moment it's at 21, so you can adjust your lens length. So by default it's 21. Then you will see that we get to a major camera. Then we're going to move it to the left, move it to the right, tilt it up or down. And then on the right hand side is your step size. Now, because this is a millimeter, once again, it's going to be 500 millimeter. My rotation angle is five. I'm going to show you now that as soon as we inside the building and you like to rotate to the left or to the right, it jumps in intervals of five degrees. Let's just have a look and see what we've got at the moment. So if I say preview, the first door opens. Then go through the second door, 
the third door is still shut so i'm going to show you how to open it and then we get into the windows so then i'm going to show you now how to turn to the left so let's go back because the first thing that i want to do is open the door now how it works is as soon as i get close to the door you will see that there's a major camera now if i'm in between two cameras then you cannot copy the major so we've got an option that you can say jump to the next major camera or let's go back to the previous camera so when do we want this door to open let's say i want to start opening the door when we get over here so i'm going to remind at that major camera we're going to use the command that says control the door window opening percentage so i'm going to click on it carry will ask us to indicate the door so i'm going to click on the door the moment is zero now as i scroll down what i like about it is is that at that specific frame number that's number 28 that's what we see at the moment so when do we want to open it so it need to start at 28 so i'm gonna select 28 hold down my shift key and let's go down for another 10 let's go up to say 38 so from 28 up to 38 i would like my end angle to be 90 degrees so i'm going to say apply and as you can see it gives it intervals so i'm going to say okay so if we now go back to the walkthrough and let's have a look and see what's happening okay so as we go along the first door opens and then when we get over here now the door should start opening now i'm just go step by step the door opens and we inside the next room now as i mentioned you can have a start slide and an end slide so let's say we would like to watch it from over here as you can see it's 30 so my start frame because it's on 30 i can just click on the green dot and that will be my start frame and my end frame i would like to say set it up to up to here so then it's 41 so i just click on the red dot and i set it to 41 so if i'm going to click on preview as you can see now it opens the door and we go up to frame number 41 but then what we want to do is we want to say get to the end of this room so if we carry on and now i would like to turn to the left now as i get to the last one the last major camera is 64. we're going to copy the major camera so i'm going to say copy the major and then i go one step back because between the major one and the next major i would like to add individual views so on the left hand side i'm going to go back and we're going to say insert which has added about 11 views so what actually is going to happen is i'm going to go to the next major and at that major i would like to let's say rotate to the left that would be the target at the end of the day then my rotation angle jumps in into five degrees and that will be the final results you can move to the left you can move to the right as well so that's where my last camera is going to stop so let's have a look at the preview so i'm just going to reverse it we're going to enter the room get to the wall to the window and we're going to turn to the left so let's take it from the start so i'm just going to take it back to zero that's going to be my start and let's have a look at the end my end will be 83 that will be my end so let's say preview and we stop so at any major camera you can make adjustments to it if you want to see where your major camera is set to you can just use the option that says move to previous major camera location or to the next then you know exactly on which major camera you can make adjustments by using the tool on the right hand side for those that's familiar with the rendering side of carry now you will notice that if you go to file save at the export you'll see that there's an option that says make mp4 movie previously it was the swf creator so the mp4 creator is open so now i can add other individual image files or i can add a folder so in this case i'm going to add a folder because i've rendered uh, several slides to a folder if i run through it it's jpx that's been created through the view rendering because I want to do a walkthrough or a walk around your model to present to your client. On the right hand side you can tell Caddy what's frame per second and at the bottom will be your output file and as you can see it's an mp4 format. So I'm going to say create, created it so now I'm going to open it.
And that's your end result for creating MP4. The first announcement I'm going to show you regarding the GIS, Geographic Information System, is that when it comes to your imagery. Now, for those that missed out on last year's launch, the GIS in the root menu, go down to GIS, and in a sub-column, you first have to tell Caddy your CRS. Now, that's your coordinate reference system. So, for this exercise, I'm going to make use of Pretoria. Picks up in Gauteng. I'm going to say OK. And now, the projection I'm going to use is 2053. Now, that will be a flat projection. First of all, Caddy will ask me what will be the radius that I'm going to look at in Pretoria. It's going to be five kilometers. I'm going to say yes. So now we're going to activate the source. If I go to my source command, those are the sources that I've already loaded. Now the last one, as I move my pointer over that last source, Caddy will tell me my type is ArcGIS image and then there's a URL link involved to this command. So as you can see, it's a 20.gov. So from your local municipality, you can add this as well by just right click add data source and I've made use of the ArcGIS image service and I've pasted the link. So I'm going to refresh the link. So if I click on the refresh button, now I will see that Caddy will refresh that five kilometer radius of my Pretoria image. And if you just pan here slightly to the side, there you can see there's a union building. And it doesn't matter where you're going to zoom in. As soon as you're going to click on the refresh, you will see that it will refresh the tiles. And as you can see, the quality is quite good. Another announcement is if I go to a second drawing. Now in this exercise, I make use of a shape file, but it can be MySQL database information as well. Is that if I go for my information and I'm going to indicate in this case earth area, Caddy picks up the information because it comes from the shape file or from the database file. I'm going to ask Caddy there's certain things I would like to write back onto the drawing. So the command, and that this is where the enhancement comes in, is that there's an option that says write properties on drawing. So if I click on the pencil, Caddy picks up the information on the left hand side that's exactly the same as in the dialog itself and you can select what you would like to write in that area. So the first exercise, I'm going to switch off the uh, just area only the form earth number. So I'm going to say OK and Caddy will ask me indicate position for text. I'm going to zoom in and I can place my text. Remember this text settings is linked to your normal text set settings. Now Caddy asked me for indicate a feature to query. I indicate this area. Once again, I only want to write the form earth number and I can place it, so for instance, bottom right hand side. So that's if you want to do them individually. If you would like to write the information to the whole area, now that is when it said apply to entire layer. So if I'm going to switch that on and I would like to add additional information. So let's say I want to add my just area as well. Then both those information is going to write onto my layer. So if I'm going to say OK, now that's similar if you make use of scope. So as you can see, if I zoom out or if I zoom in, now it's giving me my number as well as my just area. And then you can go even another step further. Now I can write from my information onto my drawing. But what if you would like to add your own, the survey contractor, you would like to add it to the properties. So now I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm going to go back to my data source. I'm going to right click and you'll see this option that says manage Northgate. Now it's giving my all my properties in the list. And then at the bottom, I'm going to ask Harry add row. So if I'm going to scroll down, then I'm going to say on the left hand side, say survey contractor. And then next to it, but we're going to make use of bar chart that is for variable characters. And then my length, I'm going to set that to say 50. So I'm going to say OK. Now you will see that if I'm going to go to information, a specific area at the bottom, now you will see that now there's another one added. And I can say in this case, it will be shop. And I say save. So if I close my information, go back to information, click on that area. They chose survey contractor shop. For the users that are familiar with the GIS and by popular demand, they ask to place the content at the correct set height. I'm going to go to a new drawing and I'm just going to set my CRS to Bristol, to Bristol in the UK. I'm going to say OK. And my projection I'm going to use is 27700. I'm going to say OK. And Cat will ask me what's going to be the area. So for this exercise, I'm just going to make it one kilometer because then we can zoom out, just uh, speed up the process. Then what I'm going to focus on while it's refreshing is that under my data source, 
If I go to my Bristol, UK, you'll see that if I go to my settings, the first announcement is use polylines for closed objects. So if I move my pointer over, use polylines for closed objects, okay, I'll tell you, closed objects can either be created as close to the polylines or AEC polygon. And then I'm going to ask Kari to set the height from the property. Now, because this is a MySQL database, Kari picks up from that settings that there's three fields. Now, I'm going to make use of a field elevation to place it at the correct Z height. So once my properties are set, I'm going to say OK, and then I'm going to refresh the area. As I refresh, it displays my contours, and let's stick to the top part first. So let me just close this dialog as I'm going to go to the information. Now, I don't have to make use of the just information. If I'm going to select on a contour at the moment, in my object properties, you will see that my elevation is 15.25. And if I select the next elevation, that will be 15.5. So there's a 0.25 meters difference between each contour line. And then as soon as I'm going to over it, as you can see, my contours is definitely at the different set heights. Let's face it from the front. There you can see it very clearly. The contours come in at different heights. When it comes to save all drawings, now, as you may notice, at the top there, I've got more than one drawing open. So now I would like to close them all. So on my left hand side under file, we had it all the time. Where it says save all windows, but new to Caddy 28 is to close all. So I'm going to click on close all and Caddy will confirm them. Save changes to, and then it will ask you for each and every file name. If you want to save it, yes or no. And now it's closed. And now I can just click on the plus sign and I start with a new drawing. Thank you, Shaw, for a great presentation, and thank you all involved in getting the launch ready for today. As always, talk to us, and we can make a better product for everyone to use. Download and install your Caddy 28 by following the link below. Call us if you need any assistance.